great. I think we've got a good group of people here now. Hi, everybody. I'd like to welcome you to Kroll's Q4 2023 Outlook Market Update Webinar. So while this is a valuation-focused webinar, and we are the largest valuation provider in the world, we do want to remind you of our other service lines. So these include, uh, but are not limited to, compliance, corporate finance, restructuring, cyber risk, ESG and operational due diligence, investigations and disputes, including personal and corporate background checks, and digital technology solutions, which I will be telling you more about in a few minutes. So uh, first, I wanted to give a few quick housekeeping items to share. Uh, this webinar is being broadcast live. We suggest that you please enlarge your media player to full screen when, when viewing the presentation. We encourage you to submit questions uh, throughout the presentation and you can submit those questions electronically through the webcast console Q&A widget, which is on this screen. If we don't have a chance to address every question, we will be sure to follow up with you directly after the presentation. A recording of today's webinar will be posted to our website over the next few days. Okay, so uh, generally we will hold this session on the first Thursday of the last month of each quarter. So somewhere around the 7th, uh, today's December 7th, and our next call happens to be on March 7th. Uh, we will limit the presentation to around 45 minutes. And each quarter, we, will, we plan to focus on these four uh, agenda topics. So it'll be technology, uh, significant regulatory developments, uh, macroeconomic updates, and valuation hot topics, along with questions. All right, so I'm Janetta Mason, a managing director in our alternative asset advisory practice. And I'm joined today by two of my, uh, by Lee Cardi of our Capital Markets Group in our digital solutions business, as well as uh, David Larson, another AAA colleague, and Peter Salvatore. So I'll go ahead and kick it off with a brief discussion of some new developments on the Kroll technology front. So I think, I believe since our last call, we've launched the document portal, uh, which is new for our clients and it allows them to upload, or for us to upload our valuation reports to a secure uh, site. Uh, our clients will be able to retrieve both current and uh, historical valuation reports and exhibits. And we have already begun to reach out to many of our clients with instructions on how to access the site and we will continue to reach out to more um, over the coming uh, weeks and months. Additionally, our debt valuation portal has also been launched. It allows our, your firm to efficiently capture, manage, and analyze investment data at scale so your firm can perform timely, accurate, and auditable leverage loan valuations across your private portfolios. And to come in 2024, will be our equity valuation portal, uh, which will allow uh, you to perform equity valuations as well. So please stay tuned for more information on that. If you have any questions or would like to hear more information, please reach out to your Kroll professional team member or anyone on this call. So now let's turn it over to David Larson for a regulatory update and a few things to keep in mind for the year end audits. Thank you, Janetta. Um, and again, we welcome you all today. Um, we're, we're, as we launched in September and now here in December, we're, our goal here is to, to provide a, a, a quick update of key matters that are going to impact um, valuations for the, the pending quarter end. A uh, few things that have happened in the last um, few weeks, months uh, that um, should, we should be aware of. Um, I think it was last week, the International Valuation Standards Council approved an update to international valuation standards. Those will be published um, come January of 2024. They're not effective until January of 2025. Um, 
it's really just to be aware of if anybody asks, um, are you aware of IVSC? Are you going to, are you complying with them in your valuation? The evaluation, the international valuation standards apply both to, um, I'll say managers, people doing a valuation in-house and external valuers. In the context of alternative um, asset investments, nothing really new here. Uh, the they don't get into the, the specifics of valuing private investments. It's much more at a, at a macro level, dealing with data inputs, review, um, and the like, um, consideration of, of ESG matters, and, and so forth. Um, most of, if we're following the IPEV guidelines, if we're following ASC Topic 820 or IFRS 13, um, we will likely be um, complying with what needs to be done with um, in the respect of alternative asset evaluations, um, may or may not comply with the international valuation standards. Um, the international valuation standards would be an enhancement to an overall review and, and, and documentation of evaluation. And you can reach out if you've got additional questions on, on IVS. Uh, the SEC recently, I think about a month ago, released their examination priorities for 2024. Um, nothing new or earth-shaking per se. Um, they, they do this every year to highlight where their focus is. Um, there is a focus on valuation. So just highlight that. Um, we spoke last in September about some of the new rules that have passed that will become effective in 2024. One of those being the need to uh, deliver performance um, information on a quarterly basis and to be able to, to develop or to deliver performance information on a, on a regular or robust or a transparent basis th that uh, the, the underpinnings from valuation need to be there. So that um, just highlights that both from the new rule, um, valuation is in the forefront and as part of the examination priorities, valuation continues to be in the forefront. Um, the number of other places um, that the SEC is focusing I'm happy to discuss those uh, along the way, com compliance um, matters uh, in general. But I think that um, I think we, we wrote a, a paper on that. It's available on our website um, and, and happy to um, delve into that with any of you as you have questions. Um, the other um, point that uh, I'll say is both um, coming but and, and is still out there is, as many of you may know, um, I think it's about a year ago now or maybe a little bit more, FASB amended ASC Topic 820 to eliminate the ability to take a um, market participant perspective for a contractual restriction. So, for example, an underwriter's lockup, which is a contractual restriction, um, many people took a discount for that contractual restriction um, under the new FASB rules, you are no longer allowed to do so. The, those rules are required for public business entities starting for fiscal years beginning after December 15th, um, 2023. So that uh, if you're a public entity, uh, then you um, are no longer um, allowed to have any type of discount for an underwriter's lockup for any new security. Um, for private business entities, which is many of our private funds, um, the new rule does not have to be applied until 2025. That said, we are seeing instances where auditors are effectively front running and saying, well, the new rule, um, even though it's not applied until 2025, for our purposes, we're going to apply it now. So that could be a, a, an interesting or difficult discussion with the auditors if you feel like you should have a discount um, and the auditor saying, well, we're just going to apply the new rule, even though the new rule is not effective. So happy to discuss that on an individual basis if, the, if that's an issue for you, but just highlight that as uh, something that is, is coming and uh, that the auditors, um, some of the audit firms are front running um, the application of the new rule. Uh, there's several different um, valuation topics. We'll try to hit some of those that are, um, have been recent questions. We'll try to hit those um, towards the end. But I think what we'd like to do now is, is really to um, hit kind of the meat of, of our discussion today, which is what's happening in the, in the wider economy and how will that translate into, um, or how do we take that wider economic um, situation and translate it into the impacts on valuation 
for our private investments um, during Q4. So, um, Peter, maybe I'll turn the time over to you to, to launch in. Thanks, David. Uh, and as David mentioned here, the objective here of this section is just to give a, a very brief economic overview uh, and then go so through some uh, key observations on public and private asset classes. Uh, I'm, not, not, I'm not an economist, but I find it helpful, and hopefully others will too, to have some data in one place as it tends here to leak out over the course of uh, quarters, days, weeks, months leading into our quarter ends. And then more importantly, we're going to interpret what this data is indicating combined with what we're seeing live from our client base and give some key valuation takeaways here for Q4. So to begin, I'm going to give the floor here to my colleague, Lee Cardi, who will go through a private loan market overview using our internal database. Lee, the floor is yours. Lee, I believe you might be muted. Thank you for that, Janetta. Yeah. Not the first time I've done that. Uh, so thanks, Peter. Thanks for the introduction, and thanks, everyone, for joining us. Last quarter, we introduced Kroll's Performing Private Credit Benchmarks. These are based on data derived from Kroll's experience as the leading <clears throat> provider of valuations in this space for nearly 20 years, a time period over which we have regularly seen thousands of middle market loans in great detail. Aggregations from these data afford analyst benchmarks that are native to the private market and they provide insight that's independent from what the more liquid but further afield markets can provide. Since last quarter, we've released in beta form access to this content via our valuation platform. And a screenshot of this is in the upper right corner of this slide. I'll be drawing on that application for much of this section. Today, we're going to be discussing results, discussing results through the end of October, but our November update will be published on the valuation portal shortly. If you already have a login, these data can be accessed at any time. If you don't have a login but are interested, please reach out to me and I can set you up. Let's start by talking about yields at the lower right-hand corner. This chart tracks the yield to maturity for two Kroll-defined benchmarks, senior lending and second lien lending. The yield to maturity here is the loan-specific discount rate used to discount each loan's cash flows in our valuations. It is aggregated with a weighted average that uses market value weights where available and fair value weights otherwise. Fair value weights make up the vast bulk of these weights. The senior lending benchmark comprises the US dollar, senior and secured term loans in our database. These represent the vast bulk of this market, and as of October, there are over 800 loans in this benchmark. The second lien benchmark is limited to second lien loans and is otherwise similar to the senior lending benchmark. And as of the end of October, there are over 100 loans in this benchmark. The chart covers the period from 2016 through to today with recent values in history at the right-hand side. Immediately, you can see that yields have entered a new phase since the period of rapid increase seen with the Fed's rate hikes beginning in early 2022. Since the end of July, senior and secured loan yields have moved up by 19 basis points to 11.79%, while those of second lien loans have remained flat at 13.92%. These relative movements generated a narrowing of the yield gap between these benchmarks. We'll come back to this shortly when we look at spreads. So let me move on to this slide here. Continuing our look at yields, the upper chart breaks out yields by three large sectors, healthcare, industrials, and information technology. To make these comparable, I focus these slides in on only the senior lending benchmark for each. What stands out is the recent dispersion in yields by sector. The lowest yielding sector here is industrials at 11.46%. This is fully 120 basis points below the highest yielding sector, information technology. A dispersion like this in yields could be driven by any number of factors, but spreads are a great place to start looking. And in the chart at the bottom, we've reverted to looking at two different benchmarks, senior lending and second lien lending. And in this analysis, we're looking at spreads. Here, Spreads refers to the difference between the loan specific yield to maturity numbers discussed above and the swap rate associated with each loan's remaining term. Since Q2, spreads for both senior and secured as well as second lien loans have tightened considerably. However, since July, their paths have diverged. Spreads for senior and secured debt have remained nearly flat, registering only a two basis points increase to the end of October 
at 722 basis points. Over this same period, the more credit sensitive second lien loan segment has continued tightening, a narrowing and narrowed another 86 basis points to finish October at 834 basis points. This may explain a significant amount of the narrowing we saw between the first lien and second lien yields. So let me move on to the next slide here. And here we're looking at spreads and for comparability's sake, we're looking at just one benchmark here. And so this is senior lending. And we've broken out that senior lending spread number between the same sectors. So the highest and lowest yielding sectors, information technology and industrials, are also the highest and lowest yielding sectors, or spreading sectors, sorry for that. At the end of October, there's fully 108 basis points difference between them. Last quarter, we noted that spreads are correlated with fundamentals in the expected way. In the bottom right chart, we plot the medium interest coverage ratio for obligors in the senior lending benchmark, and they're broken out between the highest and lowest spreading sectors. Here, interest coverage is the ratio of EBITDA to interest expense, and a higher ratio is associated with lower credit risk. For virtually all of the last five years, the median interest coverage for the information technology sector has been below that of the industrial sector. This persistently higher coverage of interest expense may be one of the supporting factors for the lower spreads in the industrial sector. So let me move on to the next slide, and I want to talk a little bit more about, uh, or a little bit about new issues. Last quarter, we noted that an important distinction between the private credit markets and the broadly syndicated loan market lies in the simple observation that there have been new issues in the former, but not in the latter. And this highlights the value of having an independent source of information that's native to this market. At that time, we also highlighted that new issue spreads were higher than for the stock of outstanding loans in senior lending. We also highlighted evidence that underwriting standards were adjusting as new issues were associated with higher margins, lower leverage, and higher interest coverage. This distinction persists, and primary market spreads at 800 basis points at the end of October continue to lie above those of the outstanding stock of loans, 714 basis points. This difference may be driven by any number of factors, but one driver may be that originations differ from the stock of outstanding loans. In the chart at the bottom, you'll see a comparison of the par distribution of new originations over the last three months, that's the blue columns, versus the same distribution for the senior lending benchmark. That's the green column or the, the green area graph. And this highlights significant differences. The two largest sectors, including the highest spreading sector, information technology, are overrepresented in new issues. While the next two largest sectors, including the lowest spreading sector, industrials, are dramatically underrepresented. Let me go forward here now and talk a little bit more about new issue activity. The chart at the top plots three month origination volumes against the four year average on a relative basis. That is, the four-year average is 100% on the y-axis, and the three-month origination volume is presented in relation to this average. A number greater than 100% indicates higher originations than, than average, and one below 100% indicates lower originations. The relative rate of origination has been falling at a very high level. At the start of this year, originations crossed into below average territory and now stand at just 30% of the four-year number. With such low originations, we wanted to see how these loans may differ from the market overall as presented by the senior lending benchmark. In the lower right-hand corner, we plot the forward calendar of debt maturities for the senior lending benchmark in order to get a sense for the maturity profile of these loans. The distribution of maturities is presented by the blue columns and the cumulative distribution is captured by the green area graph. These distributions reveal that maturities are distributed further into the future with only about 20% set to mature in the next three years. This is an indication that maturities may not, on their own, require a significant increase in issuance in the near term. Support for new issues will have to come from other factors, such as tightening spreads or tightening yields, and the associated refinancings with those. Now let me move finally to valuations here. Valuations have continued to recover from their recent dip, this timing is well correlated with the broader credit market sentiment that the economy last year faced 
a real risk of a hard landing. But earlier this year, those fears have moderated, leading to the current rally. As a result, median valuation for senior and secured loans and senior lending have increased by 50 basis points to 99%, while the same for second liens have climbed by 38 basis points to 91 spot 126%. These numbers are summaries, and there are many factors that may impact valuations. Examples here are term, size, obligor risk, and priority of claim. And as we continue to develop these benchmarks, we plan to shed more light on these factors and the impacts that they have. With that said, I'd like to hand the presentation back to Peter. Thank you. Thanks, Lee. Uh, so to begin on the economy, if I can point to a, a key event so far here in Q4, I'd have to say it was the uh, October inflation report, which came in a lot softer than expectations. Uh, this started a cascade of sorts, notable of which was the driving down of long-term treasury rates. Uh, in October, we touched 5%. Uh, presently here, as I speak, we're about 4.1, 4.125% or thereabout. And uh, this fueled a market rally across uh, a lot of asset classes. Many interest rate sense, uh, uh, industries saw significant bounce backs. Think REITs, capital intensive businesses, as well as small cap stocks. Uh, the market seems to have come to a consensus now that the Fed is done tightening and there's now a notable shift to now forecasting when the first rate cut will happen which uh the market predicts will be sometime in q2 of next year at the moment q3 us gdp came in at a screaming 5.2 percent in uh, q3 this is expected to decline significantly here in q4 and the first half of 2024 as interest rate increases uh, while not expected to increase or uh, continue to uh, uh, expected to continue to bite. Uh, so some early signs of this was the Oct October employment openings, which totaled 8.7 million for the month, a decline of approximately 600,000. This was well below the 9.4 million estimate and the lowest since March 2021. Uh, and this decline in vacancies brought the ratio of openings to available workers down to 1.3 to 1, a level that only a couple months ago was at 2.2 uh, 2 to 1. On the next slide here, we have a very broad and detailed overview of the public equity performance. Generally speaking, Q4 so far, uh, notably November, saw across the board market gains, both here in asset classes and geography. In fact, aside from energy, almost every sector and geography participated here in the rally. Um, however, here on a year-to-date basis, our Q3 theme still holds, tr holds true here for Q4, uh, which is to say much of the year-to-date gains still remain concentrated in large-cap tech, as evidenced by the NASDAQ and, to a lesser extent, the S&P 500 performance. Uh, the Russell 2000, which tilts small cap while showing a strong November at plus 8.8%, is still flat on the quarter uh, approximately at plus 1.3 percent and on the year at plus 2.7 percent on the credit market here lee did a great job explaining the private side of the house so i'm only going to take a brief moment to go through uh, some of the more common public benchmarks here uh, q4 similar to the private side has been relatively quiet on a year-to-date basis um, i'm sorry it's been relatively quiet on the quarter on a year-to-date basis we've seen spreads uh, across the board come in a particular note, and as Lee highlighted earlier, I'd like to highlight the second lien spreads. These really gra uh, were gapping out here at the beginning of the year, uh, approaching the high teens on a spread basis. Uh, and we've seen a significant spread compression from the beginning of the year. Um, so we can kind of translate this also a little bit further, I think, to apply to subordinated securities. Um, so notably mezzanine debt, subordinated debt, non-convertible preferreds. Um, certainly you could see markups on a year, to, uh, year over year basis uh, in this category. On the commodity side, there have been a couple notable developments. Brent and WTI prices have backed up considerably here in November and actually leading here into December. Uh, there have been a number of factors that have influenced this softness, which has been a theme here throughout this year. Uh, you, on the demand side, you have a lot of uh, growth slowdown expected worldwide in 2024. And on the supply side, U.S. production is at record levels. And OPEC has had issues in getting universal buy-in from its voluntary production cuts. 
Uh, and then maybe the one last notable thing here, actually, I think it just hit last week. Gold hit an all-time high, $2,100 an ounce. And uh, Bitcoin here uh, continues its march higher on a year-to-date basis. It's uh, hit a high just this week of 44000 per coin. So just a couple highlights here. Um, venture, which I haven't mentioned specifically to this point, remains challenged. It's well documented that exits are hard to come by. On the next slide, I'll go a little bit into detail on what this means for Q4 valuations. Uh, real estate, I'm just gonna touch briefly on the office market, which continues to generate uh, most of the headlines. We're now starting to see some really interesting data come out. Uh, a renewed focus on the efficient use of office space is leading to further footprint reductions and overall vacancy in the final months here of the year. Over 1.4 billion square feet, representing approximately 17% of outstanding inventory, is available on the leasing market, the most ever observed. Uh, and particularly of note is the typical size of a new lease is about 20% below its pre-pandemic average. So this has major implications for valuation uh, or property values. Currently, values are down in the 10 to 15%, generally speaking range uh, since the end of 2021 with higher vacancy and de uh, with higher vacancy and deteriorating rents expected uh, there's forecasts out there that are calling for another leg down in the order of magnitude of potentially 20 to 25 percent so thematically from a valuation standpoint i'll say q4 is going to be similar here to q3 uh, which is to say rates and inflation are still elevated despite you know the positive news at least on the momentum side so what's different is that momentum has clearly shifted. In Q3, there was real concern, uh, particularly with interest rates, uh, about where uh, about things were, were going to shake out. There was a ton of conversation about even 5 6 or even 7% Treasury rates just a few months ago. Uh, Fed rate cuts uh, were still on the table, and the inflation picture was still murky. So even with a strong November here across most of the public asset classes, growth remains highly concentrated and large businesses with, with a tech focus. This is further supported by the near non-existence of the L LBO market here in 2023. So on the, par uh, on the private market side, while valuations have held up, uh, markups still here in Q4 may still be hard to come by. Um, valuations should be more earnings driven, not multiples driven. The market's, uh, market isn't hurting or helping on the multiples. So changes in valuation for better or worse, I would expect to come from changes in future earnings expectations. On rates, with respect to uh, interest rates, even with the recent backup and long-term rates, I think higher for longer still remains here a key theme. Uh, so long duration assets such as growth equity, venture capital may continue to be challenged. On the uh, credit side, with any fixed income instrument may also continue to see pressure. Uh, and then with respect to growth equity, uh, and venture, the market continues to bifurcate these investments. Uh, so those that have a clear path to profitability or liquidity and those that don't have a, a clear path. So, be, you know, be careful. I think the only other thing I'll say with these is uh, just be careful and skeptical. We're seeing some, you know, those inside flat rounds. Um, and I think those should always be uh, uh, viewed with, a, um, you know, just a, a little bit more skepticism in this environment. Um, for those portfolio companies that have locked in low rates, you know, so fixed pay or via swap, there can be meaningful benefits that are accruing to shareholders. So this could also apply for year end uh, tax valuations. Uh, so if there, this is more minority equity position related as well. So the, the last time we saw a phenomenon like this was during the great financial crisis. Back then, you had credit spreads gapping out. So this was a universal statement across fixed pay and uh, variable pay securities. Uh, so, so now we have base rates that have increased substantially. This is more of a phenomenon that would really only apply to fixed rate securities. And then lastly, here on the credit side, uh, KPI should be coming more to the forefront, liquidity KPIs, that is. Uh, this especially holds true for portfolio companies and capital intensive industries unlike prior economic cycles where uh, you would often have distressed covenant light deals middling along as long as interest payments were made, many businesses this time around are gonna have a, a much shorter runway. Uh, so from a valuation standpoint, this means we may be measuring a recovery 
uh, when we have historically measured from a yield standpoint. And lastly, I showed this last quarter. Um, as far as guidance, nothing's changed. Um, the only thing I'll, I'll highlight here uh, with respect to WAC is base rates have come in meaningfully, um, as, a, uh, as at least as a percentage on a percentage basis. So, you know, I think last quarter our input was 4.5% on the base. Again, as things stand now, um, all else equal, we're at 4%. So you could see a slight reduction in your cost of capital estimates. Uh, heading into year end. Um, and again, that's just assuming betas haven't changed. So David, I'll pass it back now to you. Thank you, Peter. Okay. Um, and before we get to questions, uh, I just, just wanted to say, um, you know, thank you again, Peter and Lee. Um, that was a lot of valuable information. And, uh, you know, as everybody can see, there's a lot going on in the capital market space. Um, just as a reminder, our goal in, in these quarterly outlook valuation sessions is to provide everybody with a brief overview of key factors that are impacting valuation. So we know we could spend uh, significantly more time on all of these topics. Um, but again, um, as we're about to head into questions, um, if anybody does have any additional questions, you know, if you aren't able to put it into the chat window now, um, please feel free to reach out to any member of our professional services team. So um, now I'll go ahead and uh, hand it back over to you to kick it off with the questions, David. So thank you, Janetta. Uh, in addition to those that are, are coming in via the, the, the widget, the, the Q&A box, um, a few that we'd had in advance that we just wanna touch on because I think they, they, they've been recurring questions during 2023 and even before, but I'll just hit some of those um, quickly. Um, First and foremost is um, given that what well, we just heard about the the kind of macro environment and the in the debt markets, um, one of the questions that's often out there is how should I think about debt in the con in the context of a of a leveraged buyout, and and it, especially in an environment where interest rates have been rising, where the availability of debt may be less than it once was, when we think about a transaction or and the fair value of coming to an, an equity security i'm looking at an equity security now in the in this context we, we generally look at the overall um, enterprise value and subtract the value of debt to get to the um, value of our equity well if we follow asc topic 820 and ifrs 13 we are supposed to be thinking about it from the context of a market participant so that market participant buyer, what level of debt could they get? What would the pricing of that debt be? And how would that impact the amount of, of equity that they would be willing to pay? So I think that the point here is that there's a good deal of judgment that is, is required uh, and that we can't just uh, assume that the existing debt could be rolled over to the new buyer. That may be the case in many situations, but by the same token, it may not be the case. And so we want to, as, as in, especially investments with significant leverage um, are evaluated, it's really taking into account that judgment. Could the same level of debt be obtained? Could it be at, at similar pricing? And what impact would that have in the context of, of, of valuing the equity? Just a, a, a key judgment that needs to be uh, made as we come into, um, year end, quarter end. Uh, another question that has been um, coming, let's say more frequently than, than I think we would expect given how the fair value rules have evolved over um, the last couple of decades is the, the question about um, when I uh, uh, issue a, um, a debt instrument or a credit instrument and I get an equity kicker, why is it that the credit component is valued less than par? And deal teams in particular let struggle with this, with this concept. And, and fundamentally, the, the point here is, is that if I issue debt for at, at the value of 100 and there's an equity kicker that has a value of 10, if the value of the debt on day one is 90. Um, it's not that I get, um, because, and that 90, um, what basically it means is that the yield on that um, debt to take it back to par, back to maturity, is different than the papered yield. So it's really a calibration question. It's something that um, is, again, sometimes deal teams want to struggle with it because they don't want to say, 
um, well, the value of my investment, um, just the credit component, how could that be less than par when I just issued it? And it's the context is you didn't just issue a plain vanilla piece of debt, you issued debt plus equity and debt plus equity is still par, but the, you have to bifurcate the two pieces, value them, and then add them back together for the purpose of valuing the overall instrument. <coughs> We're also seeing um, a, a great deal of interest in the more timely, more frequent um, valuation space. Um, sometimes that's um, the 40X space, sometimes that's other um, vehicles. Um, just highlight that that is probably going to put more pressure on managers over time to deliver a robust fair value and to deliver a more timely fair value. Those who are, are allowing access to their underlying investments on a monthly or daily basis um, effectively are taking the last reported net asset value. They're validating that to see that it is fair value based. Um, and then we, either they are, in many cases we're assisting them to take the, um, that last reported to uh, cash adjust it to market adjust it, to take into account any market movements um, from the, the preceding um, reporting period, whether that's monthly or daily, and then and um, taking into account any idiosyncratic um, factors, um, any major things that, that would need to be taken into account, known and knowable, um, changes, a ransomware attack, um, changes in management, um, bankruptcy, any of those things, to come up with the, the new value on a, a, like a daily or monthly basis. So just highlight that those those are out there. It's something that um, we're seeing more and more often. We're helping managers with, and then we'll see how that continues to um, progress. And then, kind of finally, um, the uh, we are seeing uh, as we started with the beginning, the SEC has a plan to look at the um, valuations going into 2024. Um, the Luxembourg regulator has been, um, there's been discussions about them being more robust in their uh, assessment of fair value and, and how they, they view it. Other regulators around the world are also looking at the um, private asset classes, um, private equity, alternative assets, private debt, um, to be able to make a determination of what's the impact on, on their local um, well, let's say regulatory environment, um, economies, and so they're again trying to focus on how much, how much pressure do they put on valuation at the same time knowing that pressure on valuation could impact um, at AUM allocated to a jurisdiction. I'll stop there. Um, Jeanetta, I know that there's, um, the, there's as, uh, as normal, we've got a couple additional final questions on are the slides going to be available? They'll be available after the fact. I'm not sure that the, the, the download button works yet, um, but we'll be do, they'll come to you if you've um, participated. But I'll, I'll stop there, Janetta and, and or Lee and, and Peter. See, do you have any other burning questions? Um, but I think this our goal here was to just hit some of the things that we've seen repeatedly and then to be able to, um, again, address where we, our crystal ball is how things are going to look going forward into um, quarter end, year end. Yeah, thank you, David. Uh, it doesn't look like we have any additional questions at this time in the chat. Uh, but if there is any, you know, anybody has anything, please submit it now. Um, otherwise, uh, we can, I think, end maybe in a couple minutes early. Um, and um, I will say just as a reminder that um, if there are any questions that come up afterwards, you know, you can always submit those um, to us in advance. Um, you can reach out to any of us individually. Um, as a reminder to um, for the digital solutions, um, Lee had mentioned that before. Um, he's a great resource to reach out to if anybody has any questions on that. Um, but any of, one of us can help you um, with any of the questions that you have as well. Um, I will say, our, as, as a reminder, our next Outlook valuation will be the first Thursday in March, which is March 7th. And uh, it looks like we might have one additional question. Okay. Uh, so, you know, I don't know, Peter, if you want to take this question that's come up in the chat box. On tech versus uh, portfolio company valuations? Yes. On tech versus, uh, on te I'm sorry, tech VC portfolio uh, company valuations. I think, you know, look, I think it, I think it's going it, to, it depends, you know, I think um, a lot of these are going to be, um, 
these are all clearly um, milestone based investments. So I would say for a lot of these that that needs to be assessed, meaning are they are they kind of rolling things out to plan? Um, are they had a plan behind plan? Um, these are obviously hard to comp to on the public side. Um, and look, this is an environment I would say too where um, you know, ca cash flow yield is, <clears throat> excuse me, cash flow yield is king. Um, so, you know, just to maybe use two, ex I wouldn't say extreme examples, but two differentiating examples, if you're behind plan, um, and you're in need, <clears throat> excuse me, in need of near term outside capital, um, you know, that's one thing. If, uh, you're ahead of plan, um, and you know, you're, you're, close to or cash flowing on the positive side and you have some runway, um, you know, that's, that's another, um, you know, thing to think about. And, and again, uh, the market clearly likes, um, one of those examples more than the other. And, and Peter, if I can jump in there too, I think there, I've seen um, questions, uh, um, in some of the very large VC firms, some, some have said, well, this firm's down, this firm's not down. What, what does that, what does that mean? I think part of this is that um, if you have a tech heavy investment fund, especially going into last, the end of last year, um, there was probably indicators that, that many of those investments should be written down. Um, some of the firms did it and some didn't. And so depending on when you kind of took the, the medicine that impacts whether or not um, an, an, an investment went down. So if I didn't write something down, let's say last year or early this year, maybe I'm going to be doing that now because there's not been that, uh, let's say, a huge rebound in the tech side. If I did take um, um, something down substantially and maybe in advance of my, my peers, maybe it looks like from over um, a 12-month period, I, I didn't write down and they did and vice versa. I think you have to take that all with a grain of salt to say, all right, when did they take it down? Um, because things are not always um, apples to apples, oranges to oranges. So. Um, on all things being equal, I would expect if you didn't take it down at some point in the last year, you probably ought to be thinking about that now. All right. Thank you. So I believe our time is up. Uh, thank every I want to thank everybody again for joining, and uh, hopefully we'll see you all in three months. Have a great uh, New Year's and holiday season. Thank you.